Aloha and welcome to World of Books. I am your host, Mihaila Stoops, and I'm streaming live from my home in Honolulu, Maui. Inflation, high interest rates, populism, central government fighting with states. All of these are signs that Ray Dalio describes in his book as the beginning of the decline of the United States as a world power. The book is called Principles for Dealing with a Changing World Order, and it is subtitled Why Nations Succeed and Fail. To discuss this book with me, I have invited Dr. Carl Ackerman. Dr. Ackerman is a recipient of the Presidential Scholarship from President George H.W. Bush. He's a PhD in European history from UC Berkeley, and he has taught history at Punahou and Yolani schools for 37 years. Last but not least, Dr. Ackerman is also an author, and his books may be purchased at carlackermanbooks.com. Dr. Ackerman, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I'm blushing here because of that wonderful introduction, so thank you. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And I'm going to jump right in and um, start the discussion on this book. Ray Dalio, the author, has studied the history and the economies of several former empires over hundreds of years and has determined certain indicators and patterns, and that's a cycle for their rise and fall. And according to him and the information he provides in the book, United States is now in the fifth stage of the cycle, basically five to 10 years away from a decline as a world power. Do you agree with his assessment of where we're at? Well, let me, let me start by, by also mentioning some of the other sort of um, things that he mentioned. So, I mean, you know, he, he draws these sort of uh, cycles, as he so uh, eloquently mentioned, and he talks about the new order beginning with, you know, consolidation of leadership. Uh, that's his first category. His second category is uh, resource allocation and government bureaucracies being formed. The third one is when there is peace and prosperity. The fourth is when there are excesses in spending and debt and widening social gap between the haves and the haves nots. And the fifth is which he, as you most appropriately and eloquently explained, says that there are bad financial conditions. And then of course the, the ultimate uh, chasm is when there's revolution and war and then the cycle begins all over again. Um, you know, uh, as a historian, I'm, I'm not much uh, given to cycles and even by his own um, criteria, the United States I think is still in pretty good shape. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Adalio talks about the things that are, are really important for a, for a country are education. And, you know, um, while our educational system is not perfect, we're still doing pretty well. We still have competitiveness, which is the second um, uh, category. The third category, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here. There are more categories, but innovation and technology. I think there are very few countries in the world that can surpass the United States and in innovation and technology. And I, um, despite the fact that we just had, you know, a COVID crisis, which is one of those contingencies that, although the author addresses, doesn't really account for, like in the early part of the 20th century with the uh, so-called sp uh, Spanish flu, which really began in the United States. Uh, I really think that, um, uh, well, I understand his uh, cyclical notion of history, I would give the United States a little bit more time. And um, as, as we mentioned before the show went on, um, there was another book that said some of the same things uh, by Paul Kennedy about the rise and fall of great nations. And I think the United States has some more time, although I think that every high school history student should read this book. Um, Mr. Dalio is, uh, is, is I, what I like about it is that he equates these cycles and he, then he goes into a fairly long description of both European and Asian history. And I think that's just, you know, as a historian, of course, I think that's wonderful. So I think he should be congratulated on that, but I do not agree with his conclusion. That was my long way of answering your very simple question. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. Um, the good is excellent for um, high school students, for anybody that wants to 
understand a little bit more about macroeconomics or learn about uh, China, uh, China's history as an empire and also its current rise, um, European history as well. So there are good things uh, about this book that I've learned and I've enjoyed, but as just like you, I'm a little reluctant when it comes to describing where United States is in the cycle. And I'm even more reluctant when he talks about China and China being about five to 10 years away uh, from becoming the world power. And uh, to argument that, he states that, you know, China is already um, an aspiring uh, leader when it comes to education. And uh, also when um, it comes to technology, and um, I, you know, I have a hard time thinking that all those PhD factories in China, all those huge schools with you know thousands, tens of thousands of PhDs every year, and given the fact that there's there's so much information about intellectual theft coming from China. I, I, I kind of doubt China being an, uh, an education powerhouse. I still think that U.S. is quite ahead. I, you know, I think you're right. And I think that there are many Chinese students that come to the United States for, for that very reason. Um, I would also say that one of, the, one, of the, one of the problems with talking about China, of course, and this is, this is probably the only major fault in this book, is that I think there's very little attention paid to, you know, ideology, um, you know, and we'll come back to this when we talk about, you know, there, there are samples of, of, of Russian history, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we're not that far from the 1960s and the Cultural Revolution, and we still have a Marxist-Leninist um, government. And, uh, you know, with Marxist-Leninism, even though there's a great deal of freedom now in China to pursue things economically, things can change very rapidly. And um, most uh, uh, native Chinese entrepreneurs, that is in the People's Republic of China, realize this. And so it's much safer to be innovative and um, entrepreneurial in the United States than it is in um, China. And let me give you one more example of where this book fails to deal with ideology. You know, um, there's, there's a great um, uh, quote, and I, I think he's right about after the 30 years war and after the English revolutions, you get to the building of nation states. But the problem is that there's no identification of why this was the period. Um, and it wasn't just the destruction of the 30 years war, it's because no longer did you have a unifying Catholic uh, unity in um, European history. It had been destroyed in 1517 with Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. And with the pulling back of different countries, um, including England, I may add, um, for very, uh, for very uh, mercurial purposes, um, you know, you have uh, the development of nation states because you don't have the unity under the Catholic Church uh, that occurred during the Middle Ages and in the early and in, 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 um, early modern Europe. So, um, uh, going back to your original point, I think that um, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that um, China's iffy. It is true that they're building up their military and their they have many more battleships and things like this, but they also have an unpredictable um, leadership. And that leadership is very controlling and um, I would say totalitarian. We, we definitely have a very complex relationship with China. Um, we're looking at the news of uh, Speaker Pelosi visiting Taiwan and um, you know, all the commotion that is causing. So obviously there's quite a big rift between US and China when it comes to Taiwan. Um, you know, we have the trade wars that were initiated by former President Trump. Um, we have um, military confrontations in the South China Sea between US military and Chinese military. And China holds one trillion dollars worth of U.S. debt. So it is a complex uh, relationship. And um, I think that in a way they are already our rival. I'm not sure who's winning yet. Yeah, I, I think that the part about the debt is concerning, um, but 
one must remember that you know it's not that far back in history um, to go to where Bill Clinton um, was president. And uh, you know, I'm not talking about Democrats versus Republicans. I'm only talking from an economic viewpoint here, where our um, our debt was turned into surplus. So, I uh, you know I will always bet on the United States, and I you know I I believe in our banking system. I believe in our um, you know, stock market. And uh, there will be ups and downs, I believe. Uh, but um, we do have to do something. I think the book is correct in calling out the notion that our, we have a, you know, we have a huge debt to China and that's no good. Um, and the United States, of course, had, was the, uh, you know, the country that people went to for credit and for money, um, uh, you know, shortly after World War I, when we started to take over from Great Britain. So that that you know that that notion of the Dutch being very powerful and the British and then the Americans is a, is I think a good part of this of this text. But uh, you know I'm not ready to give up on the United States quite yet and say that you know although China is our competitor you know they're they're better. And after all, as he as he maintains, you know we still are printing the dollars, and the dollar is still the currency for the world. So yes, it is the reserve currency, and I think it will continue to be even by his own admission. What are the choices there? Um, he does present a uh, synopsis of uh, other possible currencies, and none of them comes anywhere close to the use of uh, American dollars. So let, let's um, dive in a little bit deeper when it comes to these economic indicators of decline. And Ray Dalio um, points out that uh, people don't pay attention to what they get. Um, they and they don't pay attention, I'm sorry, people pay attention to what they get, but they don't pay attention to where the money uh, comes from to cover what they got. So translation, that would be, you know, when our elected officials are borrowing more money to fulfill campaign promises, everybody's happy, um, but nobody's looking at where is this money coming from? And, you know, um, printing more money is not a way of creating uh, wealth. We're coming out of COVID. And we all recall that in 2020, the U.S. government financially supported businesses and individuals significantly. And we're all very grateful for that. But did it create any wealth or did it actually increase productivity, which is uh, the leading cause to wealth? In my bubble, I'm going to speak about my bubble only. Uh, what I see is it's very hard to contract any service providers. And it feels like there is less desire to work that people are more sufficient somehow. And I, I wonder, what do you see in your bubble? You know, again, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna agree with you. I, I think that, <clears throat> pardon me, that I think that there's, you know, whenever you give out a lot of checks, um, you know, and people can spend more, um, you have to also urge people to save more. And <clears throat> with Americans, you have to make sure that everyone's um, get and be coming back to work. And I work um, as a director of a um, hospital here in Honolulu. And, you know, um, we had to import nurses during COVID. Um, and so I think that the labor supply issue is a difficult one right now. And I think that we have to worry about, um, you know, and I, I think this will add a bit to the inflation about employing workers um, at a higher cost. Um, but I think our politicians, and I'm going I'm to interject something a little bit new here, is I think we have to deal with our expenditures. And, you know, no politician is going to um, question or to um, try to shrink government programs like Social Security. And <clears throat> they're going to have to. They're going to have to attack, uh, you know, attack big programs that are um, spending a lot of money and for good reason. Um, but there has to be some sort of curbing so that people can have, I mean, you know, people who are my age and older uh, can get social security just fine, but I'm worried about the people 20 years from now or 30 years from now. So as you said, our politicians have to have sort of a, a long-term perspective and not 
um, just give in to the, the contemporary moment. And I think also from having a good friend here in Hawaii, who's a general, um, I think that also our expenditures on the military, while extraordinarily important, and as uh, Mr. Dalio says in his book, you know, a strong military and a strong economy really will put you in the in his top category. But we need to keep the military supplied, but there's a lot of waste. And I think we have to worry about a lot of waste. And the other thing I would say, kind of complementing what you have said already, is that uh, we have to encourage Americans to save because uh, you can't spend what you don't have. And of course, credit cards are the, are the big problem in America. <laughs> Well, I was surprised to see that the author admits that there is no connection between wealth of a nation and happiness. And as an immigrant to the United States from Romania, I immigrated 18 years ago. One of the most surprising things for me is that here we are in what I perceive to be the wealthiest country in the world, yet you have people that go into significant debt while they're in medical school, or they, um, they have to mortgage their houses and default on their mortgages to pay their medical bills. And to me, that's just not acceptable. So where is our government? Are they focusing on its wealth or our happiness? And does it have to be one or the other? Can it be both? You know, um, there are um, people who, um, you know, are, yeah, and I think this is the problem with American politics, um, is that they tend to have blanket um, statements like, you know, all government spending is bad. And I just outlined where I think that we might have to curb huge government programs. Having said that, we do very little for the elderly in the United States. And we need to, you know, if people are going into, you know, an older age home, they shouldn't have to sell their house to do that. So I, I think that our politicians, politicians, while maybe curbing parts of our social security system, also have to spend more to make that possible. Now, in terms of your question about happiness, and which I think is a good one, I mean, why aren't all Americans happy? I mean, we live really well compared to the rest of the world or most of the rest of the world. Um, I think that has to do with a question I heard a reporter asking um, Mikhail Gorbachev when he was mayor of Moscow. And he said, it may have been Ed Bradley, the CBS reporter. Years, this was years and years ago, 20 years ago. You know, I'm looking at you and you, know, you probably were you know, a little girl or you know, a young, very young person. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, you know, uh, but anyway, Ed Bradley and, and Mikhail Gorbachev and, and Ed Bradley said, you know, what, you know, what can we learn from you and what can you learn from us? And Ed Bradley said, look, you know, what you can learn from us is, uh, I mean, I'm, Mikhail Gorbachev said, uh, you know, and I, I hope I'm not confusing Boris Yeltsin and Mikhail Gorbachev. I think Mikhail Gorbachev was mayor of Moscow before he became president. But anyway, um, either one of those two. Um, he answered the question by saying, what we can do and learn from Americans, you know, there was still the Soviet system, it's not to stand on line for so long. And what you can learn from us, uh, you know, I, I was thinking perhaps by reading Russian literature, like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and uh, Turgenev and, and Chekhov, uh, but he didn't say that. But he said, what you can learn from us is to be more philosophical about life. And interestingly enough, I think in Hawaii with, a lot of the um, sort of um, springboard of the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, um, and I'm not promoting the Hawaiian sovereignty move movement by any means. Uh, I'm not taking a position one way or the other, but I think that Hawaiians have offered us a more philosophical um, framework for viewing living. And, uh, and I think, you know, taking care of water, you know, taking care of the aina, um, enjoying hula, you know, um, slowing down a bit, but also being more reflective about how we live our lives. And uh, perhaps we should drink less coffee and drink more tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good suggestion. And um, it, it kind of leads me to, to discuss what the author recommends to do in the future, knowing all these um, things about the upcoming decline of 
the United States in his view. And when it comes to what we should do, he's rather vague. Um, you know, he says, yeah, you should, um, you know, reduce your expenses, you should diversify, um, you should surround yourself with smart people. And um, I want to tell our viewers, this is what Think Tech Hawaii is trying to do here, is to bring the smart people to you. So keep watching Think Tech Hawaii. Now, after reading this book, um, is there something that you want to do to prepare yourself if this decline is indeed happening? You know, as a historian, I was really fascinated by his um, economic analysis. And he said, you know, he kept talking about, you know, um, about you know, can't spend more than you have. And <clears throat> not that I don't do that already, but um, I really found his, his economic analysis of what was going on in our society. I mean, uh, this is a gentleman who's um, part of the, one of the largest hedge funds in the world. And so I, I was very impressed uh, that he combined history with, um, with economics. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, I um, mean, I work often with the college board and I'm gonna recommend this book uh, for people who teach European history or you know Chinese history and things like this. But I wanna come back to one point um, and that is <clears throat> with the transitions in the cyclical history, again, um, where the book is strong, it's strong in many points um, and it's strong on economics, it's strong on the analysis of history about what happened in history. That's always very good, but there's a real um, uh, overlooking, I think, of the ideology in China, the mandate of heaven system, where things are granted to certain rulers because of uh, their obedience and taking care of people. And when that mandate leaves, then the dynasty it gets removed. When you're talking about the October 1917 revolution, the whole Marxist-Leninist uh, coup d'etat of Vladimir Lenin. So a lot of these things are contingent, um, civil wars, etc., on specific, um, on specific um, governments and specific events that happen. And even going back to the pre-30 uh, years war period, um, when you know, you're discussing, you know, somebody like Louis XIV, um, you know, he had a form of mercantilism, um, but he also had a form of absolutism where he said that he was a direct descendant of God. And that has to change um, in order to develop nation states. So that's kind of missing in, in the book. Um, but I, I think, but I, what I found really um, interesting is that he wanted people to take note of what is going on and you know that um, that that inflation is is not a good thing, and it's going to affect people dramatically. Now, whether it's going to take down the United States, I doubt that. Um, um, but again, where the where my criticism would come in is, you know, this was all contingent on Russian oil prices and invasion of the Ukraine. And you know, someone says, "Well, I could have predicted the invasion of the Ukraine." Well, you're better. You're a better person than I am. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm especially before the you know the invasion of the Crimea. Um, because remember Boris Yeltsin um, handpicked Vladimir Putin, and we might have say, seen it in his biography, but if, if people could predict history, and when I always tell my uh, students, um, and I cross it out in their writing, uh, both at the university level and at the high school level, if they say history shows or history, you know, uh, uh, throughout history, I, I tend to be think, I think of history being more specific to the time period and the different contingencies of specific events. Well, Dr. Ackerman, I feel like we need like two more hours to discuss <laughs> these issues in this book. So I thank you so much for um, joining me today. It, it's truly been a very um, eye-opening conversation. And to our viewers, I wanna let them know that two weeks from today, we will be discussing Vladimir Putin's plans to make Russia a world power, as described in Marvin Kelb's book, Imperial Gamble. So join us in two weeks to see the show. And until then, read everything you can and enjoy it. Ahui ho.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.